Okay, hi everyone, uh, I'm Yoss, and today I'd like to share with you uh, building scalable applications with the serverless framework. So this talk will be an uh, introductory talk to what serverless is all about, and we'll also go into a bit more detail of what building a serverless application involves. So let's get started. So first of all, um, when we say serverless, it doesn't mean that there are no servers running anyway. There's obviously still servers running somewhere. And, but the difference is, as a developer, you don't need to think about these servers. You can just focus primarily on your application and on your, on your code, and less on infrastructure concerns and server provisioning, deployments, and so on. So, so most web applications today has a front end and a back end. And our back ends run on servers. Uh, traditionally on physical machines. But in the past few years, several technologies in the platform layer, the technologies between your operating system and your application, has improved. Where we started off with uh, physical machines, we started moving on to uh, virtual machines and the hypervisor, then to containers, and at each step of this pyramid, we move closer and closer into managed solutions where we don't need to care about the servers themselves. So if you look at this, uh, the right diagram here, you would see as we shift towards more managed solutions, so the blue color means that we don't manage it ourselves. Somebody else handles it for us. So as we move upwards into this pyramid, we offload more of the task of all the server stuff into a third party that is most likely better at handling it than us, and, and cheaply as well. So, and the next step in this pyramid is serverless, or functions as a service. So functions as a service platforms lets you deploy and invoke uh, ephemeral, it means short-lived, functions uh, that handle individual requests. So uh, uh, traditional plat pass platforms, platform as a service platforms, are focused on hosting long-running server processes. And these processes would run 24-7, always listening to incoming requests. And generally, you are built in monthly billing cycles. But with serverless, the functions are invoked when an incoming request, uh, when you have an incoming request, and vanishes when the execution finishes. Uh, so the way these uh, fast platforms like AWS Lambda works is you first upload your code to the uh, serverless platform. You can then set up triggers that the platform would use in order to trigger, uh, to execute your code. For example, you could set up an HTTP event to be able to trigger the execution of your function and so on. And the fast platforms would be uh, would handle all the horizontal scaling on their part. They will spawn as many function processes as there are incoming requests. Yep. And obviously, you only pay what you use in terms of execution time and the number of actual function invocations. So behind the scenes, how do these platforms execute your code? So when a Lambda function is invoked, a container is provisioned with some execution environment defined with a, a certain amount of memory and uh, timeout, basically a set of uh, attributes uh, for that particular execution environment. But it takes time to set up this container to bootstrap the whole process. And this causes something called a cold start latency, which is basically on the first invocation of a function that haven't been executed in a while, it will take a bit more time because it, take, it needs to all do all this bootstrapping uh, from scratch. How long, how long do you expect that to take? Um, it will depend on the language and runtime. For example, some runtimes like the Java, Java would have a longer uh, bootstrapping time. I think it could be, I don't Very remember so offhand. It's 20 milliseconds. So you expect it to always be 20 milliseconds? Sorry, 20 milliseconds? Uh, th this is for a hot invocation. It refers to a hot invocation. So I think if I remember correctly, it's a, in, for Java, 
it would take a minute or something. It's not per your previous slide said create an instance in 20 milliseconds. Start, Start instances. Uh, that's not hot because to start the instance, that's, a, that's, a code, that's true. Well, I guess there are uh, serverless platforms like Fission, I think, that keeps like a warm pool of instances always running, technically. And we just copy over the code into a warm pool of instances. And these platforms don't have the long cold start latency. So I think it would depend. Okay. Yep. So, so that, that's when you know the second. It's just interesting to see a number because I haven't seen the numbers before. Yep, yep. So, so you're quoting a number here. Yes. I'm just asking, is that valid? It is valid for some platforms and for some runtimes, I think. For Lambda? Not for AWS Lambda, I think. Right, okay. Yes. At least for. Basically, you can have 50 milliseconds. After all, this is just a tweet from Adrian Quackfrog, which even is working on AWS, but like it's more like a catch phrase than because you can be 25, 50. 10 milliseconds depends. It's basically they guarantee you 50 milliseconds, I guess. Um, that's I what it's like more of proportion 20 to half seconds. So. I'm sorry? I, I believe it's more of proportion 20 milliseconds to half seconds. So uh, then yeah, you can call it as a serverless. Right? Half seconds is still long, but yeah. definitely 50 milliseconds is, I think, what AWS guarantee you uh, as a Pro cold start. Pro 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 yes. Okay. All right. So, so after this code start, uh, so uh, after it's the container is done bootstrapping, the platform would maintain it for some time. So it's not killed off immediately. It would be hanging around to watch for any other requests coming in. And if there are any other requests, it would not replay all the bootstrapping from scratch. It would just use an existing container that's already warmed up. And this is significantly faster because you don't have to start from scratch, basically. Yep. So this is what a Lambda function, a Node.js Lambda function, for, uh, AWS Lambda function looks like. It's just a function, it takes a few parameters. So the event is just an input to the function. The context is used for uh, doing some metadata stuff, like checking how long the function has been running. The callback is just a function that you use to return results back to uh, whichever is calling it. So it's just a function. So next we'll look at why we should go, or we might want to go serverless. So, so the backend server traditionally runs on uh, physical machines. And these servers have to be provisioned. You need to allocate capacity to it, enough capacity to handle all your requests. If you don't, bad things can happen. Um, so, for example, with traditional server provisioning, you can, most of the time, you have to over provision because if you're under provision, you can't handle all the incoming requests. But the drawback of over provisioning is you pay for idle compute time. You pay for, you pay for resources that you're not really using. And because with traditional provisioning, you can't really change your capacity. Fa uh, that fast, you will still encounter issues where you reach a, uh, reach a traffic load that is over your capacity anyway. So this is not ideal. But with serverless, the uh, actual usage will match this uh, traffic graph exactly, because the platform will uh, spawn uh, an equal number of function processes to your through the number of incoming requests so that you don't pay for idle compute resources. So where can we use serverless? Uh, we can use it for APIs, for backends, uh, asset processing, and it's surprisingly applicable to a number of use cases. But at the same time, it is not applicable to some use cases where, for example, you need a lot of disk space or uh, uh, long-running tasks that uh, is beyond uh, the timeout limits of the uh, serverless functions. So where is serverless good for? Uh, you have scalability baked in. 
because again the platform is responsible for just spawning as many functions that you need um, so you don't need to plan for capacity really there's less ops you, technically you don't have to worry about uh, managing servers patching like for security vulnerabilities upgrading software on your machines and so on because the platform just handles all this for you you also have granular billing again instead of uh, the 24 7 monthly billing cycles of traditional pass you are built in 100 millisecond increments in of you basically only pay for the execution time that you use so I think uh, this tends to be cheaper overall so for example uh, for AWS Lambda you have uh, if you have a function with uh, 128 megabytes of memory for each 100 milliseconds you get you have to pay 0. Point Zeros, I don't know how many zeros, it's very cheap. And since you have uh, a free quota of uh, Lambda execution time every month, basically you can uh, execute, you get these many seconds for free of Lambda execution time. So where is serverless not as desirable? First is a vendor lock-in um, where because you rely so much on the uh, fast platforms for your compute uh, infrastructure, you may have difficulties uh, moving to another provider, but I don't think this is really an issue because most of the time you rewrite it completely, so this is not, you don't really move. And uh, so the next thing is the limited degree of customization and control. So you only have limited control over the execution environment. For example, uh, the maximum timeout of serverless function, uh, AWS Lambda functions is five minutes, I think. Five minutes. So that's why it's not well suited for long running tasks. And you can't really go beyond this. And you also have limited, uh, you have some control over memory, uh, but, uh, but you don't have much control over disk space. So serverless functions have a maximum disk space of 500 megabytes, and you can't increase or decrease increase this limit. So, yeah. Finally, decentralization. So I think this is more of a gener general challenge with distributed systems. For example, integration testing is not easy for serverless because you have to simulate a lot of the infrastructure that you rely on. Also, making sure that testing different separate subsystems is generally not as straightforward as, say, testing a one system. And likewise, you can't open a debugger into your function instance, for example. You have to make sure you have good monitoring and logging. And so these are the challenges of serverless. So these are some of the limits to, of uh, AWS Lambda. So you have the max, maximum uh, disk capacity. And so these things you have no control over, basically. Yeah. So next, we'll look at the uh, serverless framework, which is uh, CLI that helps you uh, build serverless applications. And, uh, so out of the box, you get a uh, structure and best practices. You basically group, have a, this idea of a service, which is a group of related functions. Get some automation to get your applications uh, deployed. And uh, you get a plugin ecosystem where you can extend the framework's uh, behavior. With, it has an active open source community. And it's also provider agnostic, meaning that um, it has a common API for interacting with uh, different uh, serverless platforms. So it has support for AWS, but also uh, other uh, cloud platforms. So yes, so these are the three key abstractions of this framework, and just servers in general. You have events that trigger functions which may communicate with some resources. So resources are just cloud services that you use to store some kind of state. So functions are just a piece of code on the cloud. So it's a function basically that you package to a zip file that you upload to the fast platform, which the, which the fast platform then uses to execute your code. Um, when designing functions, I think it is important to have, for it to be a single purpose function so you can think of the Unix philosophy, where you have many uh, small programs that interact, play well with each other, that you can just wire up 
to build more powerful uh, pipelines. Um, each serverless platform has different languages and runtimes. Uh, yeah. So we've already seen this. So this is a Node.js function. So for AWS, these are the available uh, languages and runtimes that you can use. So we have Node, Java, Python, and .NET. So the next key abstraction is our events. So events triggers functions. So think of it as like a, uh, the signals in the neurons in your brain, something like this. Uh, so on AWS, these events could include DynamoDB events. For example, when a new row is inserted, it could trigger a function after that event. Or when a new file is uploaded to S3 and so on. So these are the events available for AWS Lambda. So for example, you could trigger based off of HTTP and so on. So finally, you have resources, which is, which is just some spotting cloud infrastructure that you can use to store state because functions themselves are stateless. Um, any in-process state cannot be guaranteed to ex continue to exist in the subsequent invocation. So that's why you need to store uh, these state in a separate, uh, either an external database, a managed NoSQL database, or an external a network file storage system, or an external API, and so on. So before I go to the hands-on, I also would like to show you the uh, uh, the serverless.yaml file. So this file is key to the uh, serverless framework. This is basically a DSL that describes the shape of your uh, serverless applications. So, yeah. So let me just go straight to the hands-on. So in this hands-on, I'm just going to uh, quickly show you how uh, you can get started with the serverless framework. So here, we're using the CLI to bootstrap a new project with a given template. Uh, we, we call our service uh, my service. So let's look at the service. So servers will generate a couple of uh, files for you. Let me just close this. So this is the uh, servers.yaml file that we've seen. Is it visible? Yes. All right. We've seen. Um, so if you look at this file, uh, so this just says that uh, we have a service called my service, uh, which uses a given fast provider. In this case, we're using AWS. It describes the runtime that we're using. In this case, it's Node. And because server is, ag is agnostic, this could be uh, other platforms, like the other platforms, which I will not name. And we can also, uh, so here we also define functions. So here we have a hello world function whose source code is, is in handler.js, which is here. Uh, which is uh, which is a function called hello world, and this function hello world can be triggered by an HTTP event to the path get slash hello world. So this is basically what our service looks like. We could of course have uh, other functions here like get hello, and we can go yes, we can define multiple functions. So this is our handler file. In this case, so this is just another function, hello world. And in this example, we're just returning a HTTP response with a message and the original event. So this is, and we return the result in the callback, basically. So we can use the uh, service CLI to, oh wait. Uh, So this is not an, an exhaustive uh, e example, but uh, so you have other options as well. For example, a region, you can define which uh, AWS region you can deploy this to. And you can use the CLI to deploy our application. So this will take some time. And in the meantime, so behind the scenes, the uh, server CLI will transform this DSL to, in case of AWS, it's a cloud formation. We will create a cloud formation template of all the resources that is required <coughs> to support this application. So for example, in this case, you have an HTTP event. So behind the scenes, the serverless CLI will create an API gateway a resource automatically without you having to worry about it. And likewise, if you have other event triggers, for example, you could have a 
as she event, for example, the service framework will also create a bucket if it doesn't exist already. Yep. So let's look at the uh, progress. So here we see that uh, the ser service CLI is basically creating a couple of different AWS resources. So in this case, CloudFormation, API Gateway, and so on. Any questions at this point? Is it any way we can connect with DynamoDB from the serverless application, serverless yes. function? Yes. So where will we store the credentials of uh, DynamoDB or something? So what are the service? I want to store where you keep the credentials of it. Yeah. So I want to connect with DynamoDB. Where will be the credentials? How will can I get the credentials? Is there any index industry practice? Mm, you, can in you can include the ARN of the table. If it's an existing, you can either create a new table within the application itself, or you could have an existing table. And in the case of having an existing table, you can just have an ARN of the table, the address of the table, basically in the AWS space, and create an IAM role that you give to the function to have access to the table. I think, yeah. <laughs> so if the intention is to understand how we can have secret keys, uh, we can have environment variables and yes. encrypt them using KMS key. Yes, you can also so do that. That's one way to have the secrets yep. embedded into NAT. Yep. We yeah. also have, so you know, what will be stored in the AWS for Taiwan? Yes, we store the compiler of our machine. Mm -hmm. Serverless so can help yes. in problems. So, for example, So in serverless, we have a couple of helpful commands, not just deploy for, for deploying stuff. We can also invoke the uh, live function, but we can also invoke the local function. So it's a, uh, yep. But of course, if, you, if in your function you call an external API, it will call the external API. Yeah. So, yep. So I have to apply a few functions. Uh, this function working together, and I just want to call this function to test something properly. Yes. Yeah, you can run it locally. So it's invoke local. Sorry, you can catch. I just need to call invoke local. Or you can define unit tests. They would call the the function locally. <coughs> so even a, we we will see an example of a test okay. later. Yeah. Because there are some resources being started here. So yep. does the building start at this point? Depends on the resource. So for example, if you provision an S3 bucket and the, the bucket is empty, you don't pay for anything. Okay. Yeah. So it, it actually starts? It starts, yes, it could, yeah. OK, so we finished deploying. Um, so because our function can be triggered via HTTP, uh, serverless created a an API gateway, and we have a URL that we can use to trigger our function. Basically, um, so <coughs> so if we just go to this function, I would say, "Hey!" So you'd return the message. So uh, so we just call our function. And it gave us a response. And you can see that uh, the input event is pretty detailed. It's basically an HTTP request. Yeah. And it took us about 300 milliseconds. So this, is, this should have been the cold start. At least, uh, yeah, it's the cold start. It's still pretty fast, I guess. So in the second invocation, it's uh, the hot invocation and basically for the next subsequent invocation this is hot and you can see the time is lower than the cold start so that was the cold start latency and that was basically how you can get started with service framework uh, yeah. okay so we'll look at a more involved application uh, later on. So, so that was the basics of get, how you can get started with the uh, service framework. So next we look at a more involved example of building an event-driven pipeline. 
So imagine that we're building an image processing backend where users would supply an image to our backend, and our backend would do some analysis on this image, do some processing, and basically generate this, generate this new image. So how could how can we build something like this using just functions, which are microscopic <coughs> units of code? So we're going to use AWS and serverless. We also are going to use a different couple of different AWS services like uh, S3 to store files, DynamoDB, and recognition to do some image recognition. So one of the things I learned about after playing around with serverless for a while is that it's important to decompose your problem because, so for example, in, com in computer science, when you have a, a big problem, you split it into smaller sub-problems, and then you split those small sub-problems into even smaller sub-problems. Then you just solve the smaller sub-problems, and eventually you get, you get there. You solve it, everything. And likewise, how can we decompose our image processing backend to just a set of functions, small functions? So, so for each step of our uh, pipeline, we could create a function that is just, just in charge of that specific discrete uh, purpose. So to analyze the image would be a separate function. To process the image would be its own function, and so on. So because serverless, so this is what I, uh, the point I'm trying to make across. It's for serverless applications, I think it is, it is important to, to split your application into many granular functions. So if we go back to this idea that events triggers functions and resources, how would we create the uh, image processing backend? So the first step would be how can we, let's say that the user supplies an image URL. Uh, URL. So it's uh, the address of an image living somewhere on, on the web. And we need to save this image. So how would that step look like? We could create a new function just for downloading the image to a bucket in our infrastructure. So it's triggered by an HTTP event. And what it does is it saves the image to an S3 bucket. And in the process, it creates a new S3 event. So, so an HTTP event triggers our function, uh, which communicates with an external S3 bucket. So the next step now that we have an image is how do we analyze this image? So we could create a separate analyze image function. So it's triggered by the S3 event that's produced by the new image being uploaded. So the function, what the function does is just calls the recognition API to just return some analysis results uh, for the image. And it would write these results to a DynamoDB table. And so as a result, it would emit a new DynamoDB event, which could be used to trigger uh, the next function. So now that, now that we have the analysis results and the image, how do we process the image? How do we combine these two information? So this function, this process image function is triggered by yet another event, a DynamoDB event. And it does the image processing, and it saves it to an S3 bucket. And it emits another event that could be used in a future to trigger other functions. So again, events, functions, and resources. Uh, let's skip this part. What we get out of this is an event-driven pipeline, where an, in, an initial event invokes a function, triggers a function, which triggers an event, uh, which sends an event, uh, which sends an event, which then triggers another function, and so on and so forth. So, so this is one of the interesting design architecture, possible design architectures made possible with serverless functions. So what do we get out of this? Well, we have a backend with less ops. We didn't have to spo uh, like, uh, uh, specify a server configuration or provision any servers. So it's really fast to develop, start developing. It's horizontally scalable. Again, the AWS, uh, the serverless platform will spawn as many function processes as there are incoming requests. So you don't need to worry about scaling on your side. Uh, AWS will also ensure that your service is always up. You don't need to have a process manager running somewhere. And it's also cheap because there's no mono, like a large instance running 24-7 somewhere. It's 
the functions are just spawn when uh, there are requests. So nice. So what other things can we build with serverless? So, uh, so this is one application that we've seen, serverless asset processing, where in response to an upload to an S3 bucket, it triggers a function that does some computation. You can also use it to create serverless backends where you can imagine each uh, RESTful endpoint could be handled by a separate function. So for example, a post slash users endpoint could be handled by a create user endpoint, and so on. And uh, you can also, there's also this pattern called the uh, strangler pattern, where you slowly extract uh, individual endpoints in a legacy application and migrate each endpoint into a separate function individually. There's this one path you can take to slowly migrate a, a legacy application. And you can also use a GraphQL. You could uh, have a single Lambda function that is your GraphQL server. And yeah. Yep. Okay, so I, I'd like to show, so, so before I finish, I'd like to show you the uh, the more involved example. So this is the uh, image processing backend. Uh, so basically what we're doing here is, uh, so in order to, for the function to be able to access uh, any cloud resources that you use, for example, an S3 bucket or DynamoDB table, it needs uh, permissions to access it. So you have to define IAM rules to uh, basically give access to these uh, resources for the function. So for example, in this case, we're saying that our function can do these things for a set of tables. And uh, so we have many functions. We have a download image function, which is triggered by HTTP. We have an analyze image function, which is triggered by an S3 event of a particular bucket. And it's only triggered when a new object is created in this bucket. And you can also add other rules. For example, this is um, triggered only if the, uh, it has a particular prefix. The process image function is triggered by a DynamoDB event of a particular table. And yes, so each function could be have be triggered by many different events. And uh, so functions are just functions, not very interesting. You could have a test, for example. Uh, so for example, in this case, we're just executing the uh, actual uh, function with the uh, any external API request mocked. So we can run it without uh, having an open connection or modifying state somewhere else. Yep. So for unit tests, I think for serverless application, it's manageable. But for integration tests, it, it's, uh, I think it's still an open question. All right. So in summary, uh, we learned how serverless came to be, what serverless is all about, uh, the benefits and drawbacks. Uh, we learned some of the basic concepts, like events trigger functions that communicate with some resources. We learned about the serverless framework and how you can get started with it. And you saw the process of building a more involved application, which is an event-driven pipeline. Uh, yeah. That's all I have to share for today. Thank you. Or something, so. uh, it's kind of private. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you have. <laughs> I think for this application, I'm not using any secrets, but uh, you can specify environment variables here, for example. Uh, uh, my question is more around how does it know what uh, AWS profile to use? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, so there is actually a, uh, a default option here, like this. Okay. By default, it's like this. It basically checks your, I don't want to 
basically checks your AWS slash credentials. Yeah. Yeah, that profile. But you can obviously change to something yeah, else. Yeah, I didn't find you specified, so. Oh, there's a, a default option like this. Yeah. Is there a way I could write the same function, make money out of this guy? In my so this marketplace. Sorry? Yeah, I can expose a ah, so this function and then. But you can you can already just create an API and host it on like an API marketplace. Is it possible to monetize a function? Yeah. There is also upcoming platform like Estedilib, I guess, where you the end goal is like npm package if you are in the JavaScript world, or like Csat as a, any kind of package management where you could install your function. So if I, I, I want to do that, I don't have the AWS to take care. You know, I can write some function where there's something. Soon, yeah. soon. They can charge it. They can pay me some seventy percent, like an app store. There's no <laughs> such. There's no such platform yet. Yeah. Sorry? There's no. I don't think there's a platform for this yeah. yet. But I. I know some people are working on it. So yeah, kind of. Maybe not. Yeah, you can work on it. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. Find the right function. Not yet. Okay. <coughs> Push. Push. Any other questions? So maybe we can have a teeny tiny break of five minutes if you want to have a drink or...